Hey everyone, it is Irene Lyon here, and I have a special guest today, my husband and colleague, Seth Lyon. And um, we want to talk about, I want to talk to Seth about some of the things that he has overcome since we've known each other um, in his in his journey of healing complex PTSD and social anxieties and addictions and not wanting to be in society and all these things. And we've done another video. We've done more than another video, Seth. So we'll yeah. make sure to link those so that people can get your full story. Mm. Um, people love those videos. So I think it'd be good to go there. Um, but the three sort of things we want to talk about today mm. are um, resistance, money, so the whole money scarcity, I don't want to make money, mm. um, but I need money, uh, that, that topic. Mm -hmm. And then also the resistance to exercise mm -hmm. and getting fit. And for all of you here who are new to me, it, just a note that I have other videos on exercise and healing trauma and the nervous system. So again, we'll link those below because I don't want to go into the mechanisms of why exercise is important. We'll just say right. it is. Um, but today it's really about this resistance to these common things that so many people face. So mm -hmm. Seth, I will let you start um, with um, just, just a general maybe overview of who you are and what you do for those that are really new here. And then we'll get mm. into a question that I want to read. Sure. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. good. Yeah, so uh, right now I am a, a somatic trauma specialist with a private practice in Vancouver and also seeing clients all around the world via Zoom, helping my lovely wife out, Irene, with the online programs and students all around the world that we work with. Uh, that's my primary focus right now. Um, I'm also a musician. Um, I do sound healing. I write original songs. I, I record albums. That's sort of more my own creative pursuits, but also really important. And I mention it also because when I met Irene, that's sort of all I thought my identity was. Um, I, when I met Irene, I was living in the woods uh, in a little off-grid community running a hot springs resort. I'd been there for about four years continuous. I lived kind of off-grid entirely, like in the woods in small communities or by myself in Hawaii and Oregon, uh, apart from society for about 13 years uh, when I met Irene. And so, you know, it, this is significant because it leads directly to our topic, mm -hmm. because when I came into the world, um, you know, I had been living in the counterculture, fully embracing those values, um, you know, I had a lot of hatred against the system, uh, money in general, uh, society, uh, cities, uh, you know, the work. Uh, just the whole rat race, the, the whole package. I mean, there was a reason I had left it all because mm -hmm. I, I thought it was toxic and it is toxic. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't also succeed within it, which was what this conversation is kind of about is what is necessary to succeed. And, and that could mean many things, mm -hmm. but sometimes in a practical way, in terms of creating enough wealth for yourself that you can live and not struggle, or maybe it's on the physical front, like how do you take care of yourself and what kind of resistance might you encounter? And mm -hmm. those were, we're talking about those because those were my, two of my biggest ones was exercise and money. Um, yeah. you know, I was the composer, musician living in the woods, like just, you know, <laughs> listening to music and making music and sitting on the couch and yeah, didn't have much ambition or desire to get fit or to, or to have a living, so to speak. So that's what I guess leads us into this conversation. It does. Yeah. I mean, the, I think you kind of define counterculture, yeah. you know, it's not wanting to pay taxes, not wanting to bow to any authority yeah but then that also trickles into our unhealed traumas around yeah. boundary authority and all those elements um that's right so i almost feel the thought i had and i think macro often as you know is we almost need this new level of counterculture that isn't counterculture that is still blending in with the um the world society at large, mm -hmm. the establishments, the money system, yep. technology, artificial light, having to get into planes and trains that are just not normal for humans. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that next word would be, but it feels like how can we do that with regulation? Yeah. And still being connected to nature. Would you agree? Absolutely. 
Yeah, no, I think I don't think the solution is to have this sort of split where either you're in society and struggling or you're totally removed from it and disconnected from the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there can it depends on your on each person, right? Maybe yeah. some people genuinely are best served living off grid in the jungle somewhere. And that's fine um, for myself. The reason it was a struggle is because I realized I wanted to be in the world so I could contribute to the world. I mean, this is where the problems are, mm -hmm. is in this society. Mm -hmm. So I think that's absolutely right, that there needs to be a middle ground. Uh, there needs to be a way to bring in all the values of staying connected to the self and you know, coming from a place of authenticity and of service, of wanting to be of service to others and all of these values that are in the counterculture, let's bring that into the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've discovered is essentially is that it's possible to become healed enough, powerful enough within yourself that you can exist in this culture in a way that is embodied and healthy and powerful, mm -hmm. um, despite the many challenges um, that it presents. It just takes a lot of work. Um, and, and I think that that's really important that we, that there be a new way. Yeah. Like a, that's like bridging these, these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to read a comment from a video that I caught just this week in a second. Um, the thing that I, I think is interesting to me is you're an interesting case because you were in a total different world than you are now. Yeah. And it's impossible to go from that world to where you are now 12 years later in a year. No. no. And I sometimes, and again, this is a generalization folks, but sometimes I feel like those who are say, were in the boat that you were in where you were highly unwell and you didn't even realize how unwell you were. That's no. the other thing. Yeah. Um, is that there's this sense that I have to wait till I'm fully regulated and mm -hmm. fully healed before I can go back into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> I was working, working, you know, some, I was working, yeah. you know, 20 some hours a week at the hot springs doing food, you know, so, so that worked well enough with my level of trauma and dysregulation, which you're right. I totally didn't have awareness of like mm -hmm. in the bubble I had created for myself. I was great. Like yeah. it was fine. It wasn't until I came into the world that we really discovered and you got to discover along with me, just all the Yay. things that I had to work <laughs> through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not always going to be ideal. I mean, part of healing your trauma, I believe, and I've witnessed to myself and my clients is that you discover your sense of purpose, your sense of identity. That's not in reaction to what you suffered. It's sort of who you would have been if you hadn't had to go through all of that stuff your, your spark, your unique thing that you're here to do. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that emerges right away. Like, so for me, I became aware through my own experiences in somatic therapy that, oh, I really want to do this. Like, this is what I'm supposed to be offering to the world, but I couldn't just do it right away. Right. I had to do training. Mm -hmm. Um, in the meantime, I had to figure out some way to make some money. So what I did is like, well, I did what I could, right. I, I wasn't healed. I wasn't all regulated not even close. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for a while there, I went out and bust on the street and played music and, you know, brought home, you know, 60 bucks and change and $1, you know, uh, toonies and loonies. Um, True story. You know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I was able to, uh, get an actual job, uh, again, in food service. So, uh, in a field that I was familiar in, you know, spinning pizzas, working a, at an Italian place while I was doing my, my training and education. Mm -hmm. And so it was a slow process where there was a point where like, I would, I started seeing clients a couple of years into my training. Um, uh, I didn't, you know, wait till I was all done. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, let's start putting this to work. Um, I used my background as, as a sound healer to sort of open the door. And yeah. then I started bringing in more and more elements of the trauma work. And there was many days where I would like go to the office and see a client or two and then go to the pizza restaurant mm -hmm. and spin pizzas for, you know, six hours. So it's kind of like that. It's not like, 
oh, all of a sudden I'm stepping into my perfect situation because I'm all healed now and everything's great. It's like yeah. an evolution that takes time and creativity sometimes. And sometimes you have to do maybe some job that isn't what you really want to be doing as you work towards something else. And that's another thing I, we could talk about is mm -hmm. how to, if you're in a job that you don't fully like, right, how do you approach that? You know, so I mean, that's a, another subject, I guess. But uh, well, let, let's dive into that because I want to read this comment and this yeah. comment goes so well with that. And yeah. um, I do know folks um, who were in horrendous toxic work environments and they had mouths to feed. They had two kids and a mortgage yep. and they couldn't just say, screw you, I'm out of here. I, I quit. Yep. Like they had to stay in that high paying job to maintain some status quo so that their kids and her, they wouldn't be on the street. Yeah. And that's a survival element. But if you can go into that work environment with the awareness that we teach, yeah, it can actually become oddly fun to yeah. watch these dynamics. So I'm yeah. going to read this comment and then we'll d dive into this. So this was under a video of mine um, about boundaries. I'll post it below here so people can watch this. Um, but, but this person said, I found this in the middle of a broken night's sleep and it was exactly what I needed. So much about life in this culture demands that we push through for sheer, sheer survival's sake. Mm. I wonder if I can stop pushing through, shutting down so as to endure my toxic work environment. I only have to pay attention to the homeless people right outside the store where I work to be reminded how things could be. If I don't push through, it's such a difficult dilemma. So I'm going to start this off and then I want to hear your, in, yeah. your take on this, but yeah. this is where, um, and I, you know, I can't stress this enough, whether you all do this work through us, through our courses, which of course I'm biased and recommend, or you do this through another somatic practitioner equivalent to what we, uh, are at or where we're at. Um, w one needs to understand this physiology, this nervous system and do the work of growing what we would call somatic capacity nervous system capacity, self-care, so that you can go into these environments and have informed nervous system knowledge to navigate it as opposed to just going in, white knuckling it, gritting down, shutting down, and then being exhausted at the end of the day and more stressed. So that's the first layer I'll, I'll put into here is, yes, you need to work so that you don't end up as this person said, homeless on the street, but to do it with intelligence and with understanding of how to start working on that process of healing the nervous system in that environment. Yeah. With the hope that eventually things open up so you can find something different, as you had mentioned about yeah. authentically where a person might want to head in their life as they're more regulated. So that's what I want to say about that. What would you add to that, Seth? Well, that's, that's exactly what I would say. I, and, and it's, I guess I'm thinking about some specifics that a Please. person can, can employ. And of course, it, if you've never done any somatic work at all, um, some of this might not make full sense. Um, for some of you who've been watching for a long time, you'll understand what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but one of the things is how you can view your workplace as an opportunity to engage with your own system at the same time. So it's not just about what you have to do, the job in front of you, it's about how can you be connected to yourself. One great thing, there was a time I remember when I was really struggling with still having to go to the pizza restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was talking to my practitioner about this and, and his suggestion, which was so brilliant, which is view the workplace as a kinetic environment. So stop looking at it as a pizza restaurant and a kitchen where I go in and I have to do this thing. Think about it as a kinetic environment, meaning it's just a space where energies are moving around and how can you perceive it that way? And that changed everything for me. It's like, oh yeah, okay. I don't have to just think about here. I'm to make another pizza. It's like, feel the room, you know, uh, be aware of my energy, be aware of my body. You know, feel, am, are my feet under me? Um, is, how's my posture? Am I breathing? Am I, can, I, can I pay attention? Can I orient to the people around me, the customers in the restaurant? Can I see what's happening outside the window? Right? Can I be connected to myself and my work and the environment 
in an embodied way that's sort of feeling the energies that are happening. Um, and, you know, I think that maybe there's some jobs that are so boring and, and drudgerous that maybe you couldn't apply that. Maybe. But I think there's always a way to bring it in yeah. in some way. Yeah. Like even if you're sitting in a cubicle, yeah. like you can still be aware of your posture yeah. and am I connected to my seat and am I breathing? How, you know, am I holding tension anywhere? Can I let it soften? Maybe do I need to get up and go for a walk around a little bit? Do I need to drink water, mm -hmm. right? There's so many ways of attending to ourselves, of honoring our biology that such that even the most kind of bleh workplace can potentially become part of our healing process which is, I think, what needs to happen to ultimately change it. To Two have that evolution. To that. Um, when we are teaching in Smart Body, Smart Mind, and just recently I had homework mm. for the students, which was kind of an inside joke with everyone, but it was serious, was um, are you guys, gals, integrating this work in your day-to-day -day life? And I, I said... This week, when you put away the dishes or take dishes out of the dishwasher, if you have one, washing the dishes, cleaning up after eating, examine your movement, examine your breath, feel, sense your feet. Are you clenching? Are you looking? Are you thinking about things that have nothing to do with the dishes? And this is sort of like old, I guess you could say Zen master wisdom. It's like, mm. you know, wax, or, or, mm -hmm. you know, wax the car, paint the, f be in the moment and yeah. feel and if we could even just do that, it's it's monumental for some folks. Um, and then the, the second thought I had was if we hear stories of folks who were in prison, mm -hmm. right, detained for some years yeah, and they get out, um, some people come out not very well rehabilitated and others come out with degrees. Mm -hmm. They've found often it is religion, but some form of source that kept them going and they got involved in prison life. They helped with things. Yeah. They became um, mentors to other prison um, detainees, inmates. Yeah, yeah. inmates. And you know, there are stories like this where you you can't imagine what it would be like to be in that that space in that mm. cell, unable to leave and be free. But it all comes down to how you relate to that environment, um, yeah. and it's quite miraculous if you really think about it because humans are not meant to be caged yeah. and yet some folks come out and they're actually quite whole in the end yep it all comes down to how you choose to place your attention mm -hmm. what you choose to do with your awareness and your energy your focus um, yeah what's your lens mm -hmm. are you viewing it every day as like damn it here i have to go again and i hate this right rather than is there a way you can shift that mm -hmm. and view it as some kind of opportunity um, so yeah, that's, that's what I had to do. Um, and, and, you know, along with that, there was also the, you know, the resistance to money in general, right? Mm -hmm. The resistance to having to make a living, right? Um, be part of this slave system, you know, all of the, all of the stuff that I was so, um, tightly clung to as part of my old identity. You know, um, and, and what makes it tricky is there are ways in which our society is really toxic, right? I yes. mean, we've, we've talked about this and Gabor's latest uh, book, Gabor Mate's latest book is about this. And yeah. it's not easy. Like you, in this world, you do really have to work uh, to not be poisoned. You know, you have to work to be healthy. Um, so that it's not like I'm just, ima I was imagining it, right? Mm -mm. Um, but that doesn't mean I needed to stay stuck in it. So, I mean, I know that we had lots of conversations and fights and, you know, yeah. around this and we had to get <laughs> couples support and, you know, ultimately it came down to me understanding and accepting that money itself is not evil. It's just a tool. It's, it's a, something that we use in society and there are systems attached to it that are toxic and mm -hmm. yeah, there's people at the top who are really greedy that make it hard for a lot of other people who are not at the top. Mm -hmm. um, but how else to change it other than from within it? And so if you're going to do that, you have to use the tools of the trade. Um, so that's where I came to within myself. I was able to shift from resisting all of it to approaching it like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to beat them at their own game. 
Yes. I'm going to become so powerful and so creative and so full of life energy in my mission and my purpose that it doesn't matter what kind of toxicity is attached to the system. I'm more powerful than that. And that became a real, just very empowering place to approach it from rather than this sort of collapse and hatred, which is really a way of staying in this victim mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the shift for me around money that really made it all possible. It's like, okay, it's a tool and let's use it to work within the system and create goodness. A hundred percent. And that kind of, um, that starving artist concept, Yeah, you know, and I mean, we know folks who struggle with that in our world and it really happens in the healing health coaching world where there's this fear of, um, charging what you're worth. And, yeah. And I get it. Like sometimes pro bono work is essential and you've, we've both done our versions oh, yeah. of that. I mean, obviously with all very the important yeah i still have a couple clients who are pro bono Exa or, or exactly. very reduced price it's so important to do that but yeah. that doesn't mean you don't charge what you're worth the rest of the time exactly yeah. and i really like what you said about uh kind of beating them at their own game these these higher powers i mean all one needs to do is watch the the netflix or this show it's not netflix dope sick about the mm. Oxycontin crisis and that pharmaceutical company that was in bed with the FDA and the money yeah. that that was exchanged to that basically created the opioid crisis here in North America. And I mean, we we're seeing the after effects yeah. right where we live here by our studio yeah. downtown. And it's disgusting and it's gross. I think we have to be aware. Yeah. And so you yeah. and I both agree that it is so important to accept the evil that is in yeah. the world. The bastards and, are real. <laughs> fuck yeah, they're yeah. there and it's like, I see you and I'm yeah. going to counter you with a higher energy, doing better work. And so I say this to all the healers and helpers here and, and artists, it's like charge money, you yeah. know, do, make a good living so you can put back into the system and hire more people to work for you. and create good business, good, solid business. And I know this talk isn't about business, but it's like, this is what it is. It's part of it. And there's just so many folks in our world that aren't getting to that level. And I just encourage everyone to be capitalistic in a good way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. any other, any other uh, advice for being in that work environment? I think what, um, your practitioner said about being in it as a kinetic environment is huge. Yep. Anything else? Basic biology. You yeah. know, how can you stay connected to your basic biology? Drink water when you're thirsty. Don't override. You know, don't bear down and, and ignore the need to go pee. You know, uh, just can you feel your posture? It's such a big one. You know, can you stay connected to your having your ground under your feet? Mm -hmm. um, can your knees, you know, be soft? Are you holding tension in your jaw? Right. These basic things, these basic signals you want to look for to are you starting to go into some kind of like gripping? How can you use this as an opportunity to it's like a meditation? Like, no, I have the choice. Like we always have the choice of what to do with our own internal awareness. Mm -hmm. No one can take that away, no matter what situation you're in. So bring that in, use it, cultivate it, and, and just staying connected to that basic biology and your basic impulses that you need for self-care um, can do a lot. Here's a question that I know will probably come up from someone watching this. I'm mm. tapping into my psychic abilities. So Seth, what happens if my boss is so toxic that they don't allow us to have breaks? Or if, mm. if I have too many, I get questioned and I potentially could get fired. The other mm. one would be, uh, what if I want to set a boundary and say I don't like something when that could mean I get fired? So, you know, mm. you can't always flip the bird to your employer because you hate them. But that yeah. doesn't mean you can't process that hate and anger in a contained private way. So exactly. can you speak to those two things? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's possible that there, I mean, there could be some work environments that, yeah, are so oppressive. Like if it's really like that, then, I mean, and of course we're talking about I mean, ignoring all the stuff that happens in, you know, developing nations that's Communism. truly horrific, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not, that's not even in this discussion. We're no, talking about the industrialized. This is about slave 
camps. It's yeah. like Western world where Western world H- stuff. HR and and but yeah. there still might be that transfer. If I just think in kindergarten, yeah. kids weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. Right. I still remember being in my kindergarten class and seeing kids pee their pants. Yeah. I mean, it's so so screwed up. So screwed so up. Some of that does transfer energetically to a Western world. To a workplace. workplace, it does sometimes, and you know. I think, you know, there are some cases where it's like, okay, time to get a different job. Yeah. It's, it's that, you know, there, there are usually, if you're in a certain field, whatever it is, there's usually many places in that field. Um, so it may be that sometimes it's so odious that, yeah, okay, I got to go to a different place. Yeah. You know, um, that's, that's a possibility for yeah. sure. Um, in terms of, you know, finding where that line is, I, I guess, would be a, really personal to each person. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, yes, like you said, there's the ability to, if you are frustrated or angry about something, and you realize if I speak this and lay down a boundary, I know that, I, you know, it's not good. Constantly. There are other ways to process that. You know, you can, you can, you know, check out my article on healthy aggression yes. on my website, um, where there's just very simple tools that, you know, you go to the, go into the bathroom stall and you have a little towel that you bring with you and you just and you make a little sound and you squeeze and have a yeah. little tantrum there for a little bit and then you go back out you know there's mm-hmm. there are ways to process even intense emotion but yes sometimes it may mean leaving that situation yeah. that is just the case sometimes yeah. um, and, then- and sometimes it may mean you know moving even like perhaps you need to move to a different area. Like maybe the entire culture, maybe there's a different city that would be more yeah. supportive. Like it's important to be open to many considerations, I think. That's an interesting one. Cause Mo- I don't think many would consider that, Yeah. but you know, certain, I know it's not easy just to move a country cause that requires visas and immigration and all that. But yeah. you know, within your country, if there's yeah. an area that has different offerings and different types of employment, Exactly. Right. Like someone could be in an HR position in a big corporation in New York City and it's awful and they go and they move to upstate New York, some little town and their it's HR for some on pop, you know, yeah, farm yeah. or something like you could do the same role, but it's like you totally change the environment mm-hmm. such that it, it creates a different kind of workplace mm-hmm. because it's like a different kind of society. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, there's lots of that even, yeah, within the same country. Um, I mean, more or less, depending on which country you're in, of course, of course, some countries are bigger than others, but there's usually some variety, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we covered that pretty good. Pretty good. Um, and it's, it's evolving, I think too, you know, and sometimes when we get on this nervous system path and I shouldn't say sometimes I say usually as we Mm -hmm. become more regulated as we grow more of this somatic capacity. And and I just want to also add, because there might be someone listening to this who's never watched any of our stuff. Um, this is more than just doing breath work and meditation and mindfulness. When we say somatic capacity, nervous system capacity, it, it is a definition of really learning how to be in your organs and your viscera and your posture and your movement, understanding your fight, flight and freeze responses. And so um, it's a very unique and discerning type of awareness that from what we've seen needs to be taught in our current day and age. It just isn't typically te- taught to us yeah. as we grow up. Um, so that's what somatic capacity is just for sake of um, understanding. Let's, let's shift gears to this idea of the importance of exercise, mm-hmm. the importance of not just going for a gentle walk, but vigorous Mm. exercise. Like I said, we won't get into the science of why that is important. Just everyone believe me when I say it is important. And Seth knows that I'm usually right about these things. (laughs) Um, So I'll link again those videos so you can watch those. And then if you guys have further questions, ask us under those videos. But let's talk about your journey of going from very deconditioned to where you are now. And I remember when we first met, I saw you <laughs> bend over in your little cabin and I was horrified <gasps> at your spine and how oh. kyphotic it was. You looked like an old 90 year old man. Of course, I was in love with you and all these things. I was like, 
oh God, we have Uh-oh. a lot of work to do. <laughs> but, but of course, you know, that wasn't a game, you know, that wasn't a note that's not going to work for me. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. don't worry about that, Irene. His soul and his heart is right. He loves you. We'll figure it out. And mm-hmm. we figured it out. Yeah. Um, but it took a little positive bullying on my part mm. to get to get this piece in. So do you want to just riff on your journey of becoming mm. more active? Sure. And how that blended in with the nervous system work and, and healing your complex PTSD? Yeah. I mean, my, so growing up, exercise was not a thing. Um, the, 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 the version of exercise that like the big exercise in our family was once a year, uh, we go out and have a family run competition where we run from one side of the soccer field to the other and see who wins. That was the extent to which exercise was supported. Um, and <laughs> that was just in my oh, dad's house. Weird. There was nothing in my mom's house. You know, um, so it just it wasn't it wasn't a thing that I had on my radar as being important in any way. Um, so, yeah, when I met Irene and, you know, you're a very physical, active person. You're, you know, I was you, brought up with you were brought up with it. You're brought like up with sports and hiking and yeah, and all going that to stuff. the racquetball club every week with my dad. Yeah, it was in yeah. our veins, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Well, and to be fair, my dad did encourage me to play soccer. I did play soccer, but I gravitated immediately towards the, being the goalie, which of course has all of the psychological burden and none of the cardiovascular burden. <laughs> so Isn't that right, interesting? <laughs> went right along with my whole makeup, you know? Um, so I was a goalie for like protect. 10 years. Yep, yeah. Protect. Yep. Don't have to run. Just, you know, yeah. So funny. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I didn't have any, uh, real fitness when we met and it gradually you know essentially what it came down to was i wanted to be with you right and so you i'm know, really not that bad you guys i promise <laughs> it's like well i want it's like we're gonna go on a, we want to go on a walk right it's like okay well i want to yeah let's go on a walk and it's like at first it was yeah it was unbelievable what would seem like a challenge to me like something mm-hmm. that now is like less than nothing you know just going for a little walk down you know in whistler when we were there for a while you know just a short little walk down the trail is just like, oh my gosh, you know? Well, and what was interesting, um, if I may share, which I will, is, you know, we'd go wa- walking on these trails and yeah, the, the one area, which was a viewing platform for those that live in Alpine Meadows, you know, this, yeah. it was a very short walk to this beautiful viewing <laughs> platform. And that was like, that was like the first like warm up. And then, you know, normally you do this huge loop, which is just for me is just an easy walk in the park. And for you, that was it. It's like, well, isn't this the end of the walk? And I yeah, we like, just we got here, right? Uh, um, okay. <laughs> but the other thing that was interesting was when we would walk on shorter trails, you would have a quite a severe um, stress mm. response to seeing people coming. Yeah. You know, and you'd, you'd, you'd stop and wouldn't know what to do. And, and that wasn't just not knowing how to be on a trail. That was a that was social anxiety. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which has yeah. changed completely now, obviously. Oh, completely. You're, you're fitter course. than I am now. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah. So it, it was a long evolution of, you know, okay, gradually understanding, learning through walking with Irene, going on hikes. Um, we did some skiing for a while there. We moved to the city, left to that, more just walks. And like over time, uh, becoming aware of the intrinsic value of it, which isn't something I'd ever felt like that Mm -hmm. felt sense of, Oh, it actually feels good to be moving my body in nature. And, you know, it feels good to be getting my heart rate up in the gym. It feels good to be putting some force through my muscles, through these weights, right? That's what it took. And of course that was hand in hand with my trauma healing, right? Because part of learning to feel the goodness of exercise means learning to feel yourself, right? Learning to feel yourself at that biological, uh, deep somatic way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a lot of, and this is where, you know, we, you, the, the, they talked about pushing through, Yes. Uh, right? Th- this applies to exercise in that there are some ways in which sometimes you do have to push through. Mm-hmm. And this is a real, can be a real fine balance. 
Um, everyone's different, of course. I didn't. I wasn't coming from a place of chronic fatigue, exactly. um, which is a whole different story. Um, but you know, if you're coming from a place of just you're not in chronic fatigue, you're just you don't have fitness. You don't. You're not conditioned. You know, you don't have a lot of cardiovascular health. That kind of thing. There does involve an element of pushing yourself, yeah. Um, because it's like no, your your body doesn't want to do that because it's used to this other thing, yeah. And so part of that pushing means really starting to hone into the felt sense of noticing what it really feels like to be moving, seeing if you can find the felt sense of those positive elements, mm -hmm. which is what I did. It's like okay, I'm just I don't want to maybe I don't want to be walking, damn it, but okay, I'm gonna breathe and like oh it actually smells nice and you know orient find where you are oh it's, it's pretty here i like the trees right and walk okay you just keep walking mm -hmm. right and and then eventually you get to like oh it actually feels good to be walking like i can feel the blood flowing that feels nice oh i feel my breath that feels good and so it was gradually getting more and more in touch with that and then pushing myself to more and greater and greater levels yeah. Once I discovered that there actually was value in exercise and it wasn't just like, okay, maybe that's true at an intellectual level, like I could feel it. Then I was like, okay, how do now I need to go to the next level? Um, because I still had, I was aware that I had resistance in myself to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, well, I need to get a trainer. I need to, you know, sign up for a, a month a group class. I need to s sign up for something where there's someone holding me accountable, yeah. where I have like a set time where I have to go do this. Because I know for myself, that will help me. Right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't at a point yet where I was purely self-motivated to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was maybe stage two or something or stage three, yeah. where I was like, okay, going to the trainer. <clears throat> and that's when I got into boxing. Um, and worked with a few different trainers and that uh, once I found boxing that was something that sort of took me to the next level of fitness and also the next level of awareness in terms of wow actually now I'm actually starting to feel what it feels like to be an athlete like I'm starting to actually have an athletic physique I'm starting to actually have that level of fitness um, and that led to where sort of I am now which is where just like a month ago, really, I due to your insistent you know, bringing it up over years, finally, I started walking first thing in the morning without, you know, I don't have a trainer. I don't have anyone making me to do it. I'm just, now I want to. I want to get up and I will, first thing I want to do is I want to move my body. And I had to force myself to do it for like three or four days. And then mm -hmm. again, my body's like, oh no, now I feel, now I can feel how it's good. Mm -hmm. And now I want to. And mm -hmm. so that's where I'm at now, where it's like I'm still training twice a week um, at boxing. And, and I'm, now I'm walking every morning as well. And that's like totally self-directed. And so, you're also lifting weights self-directed. Yeah, lifting weights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, what long wanna, evolution. And it is a long evolution. Pushing. And, yeah, and um, just want to note, you know, you, you and I have a healthy relationship. So, yeah. I'm, you know, for those of you imagining Irene with a whip saying, come on, Seth, you better get yourself in shape or else. It, it was never like that. It, it was more no. of a, I don't even know what I would say back in the day. I don't know if you remember. It was just like, come on, let's go. You know, like, you know, it was just like, you know there was never well, any ultimatums. Um, the, the ultimatum was around the money. That, that Yes. That, that for everyone listening, like that was a no, like if you don't get a, fucking job this yeah. isn't going to work because i can't yeah. i'm not sustaining you yeah. indefinitely um and that was as you said early in our relationship there were a lot of fights in that so i don't want anybody to believe that you know you and i were just perfectly regulated from the beginning like no there was tension um but you know the the, the <laughs> my favorite image i have is we were hiking on um black home in the high alpine yeah and it's the first time that you had done like a really intense high alpine hike and i'm pretty sure it was hot and it's long and yeah. there's no trees at this level and at one point you were like this can't be possible like how could this <laughs> how can we still it's be still going? going up how can we still be going up this just isn't <laughs> i'm like because we haven't reached the top that's why we're still going up. no no 
<laughs> but and you know, in that moment, I I didn't you know ridicule yeah. you and get mad. Yeah. I was like, it was just the facts. We're not at the top. You're fine. Yeah. Let's keep going. Yeah. And that you know, you're fine. I think might confuse some people because some of my other content mm. says never say to someone they're fine when they don't say they're fine. Mm. You know, and and but that's for children, right? That's when a yeah. ch child has hurt themselves. Yeah. You're a grown adult. I know you have the physical capacity. It is more mental. That's and right. Uncomfortable. And that's right. When and it's when and that's a really that's a really important point actually when it comes to pushing. Mm -hmm. When the resistance is just mental, that's when you know it's okay to push. Exactly. Against it. Right. I want to add a bit um cuz I know there's probably a question now from people about chronic illness. So someone who mm -hmm. is in deep adrenal fatigue, chronic illness, autoimmune, maybe recovering from uh, something an infection, yeah. you know, then yes, your story isn't exactly the story to follow, but you can still titrate. And that's the fancy word for slow little bits of movement. So it might not be that a person is going for a walk. It might be that they're in their living room, hopefully with some light, natural light windows open. So there's some fresh air and they're just, you're just moving your arms. Yeah. You know, you're doing what you would, we would call in the olden days, more calisthenic kind of exercises, not push-ups and sit-ups, yeah. but just marching on the yeah. spot. Yeah. You know, if you have some stairs in your home, I know it seems odd, but just work on using the stairs as a tool of training. So there's so many ways that you can build that up, but the key is to always pause and rest and let your system feel what it's like to come down. Yeah. Um, and the body wants to be healthy. It wants that robustness. And it just means taking a little more time. Maybe it does mean getting a somatic practitioner to help you titrate. You know, I don't think you need an exercise specialist. Mm. It's more about learning to listen to your physiology and just do these little bits of, um, really it's little bits of stimulation yeah. into the system. And there's so many YouTube videos out there for gentle movement. Um, so yeah. one might say it's the resistance that might be there to keep you from getting into that for those that might fit in more of the chronic illness elements. Um, do you have anything else to add, Seth, regarding your experience with clients and that? Yeah, I mean, I was never in that camp personally, but I've had mm -hmm. a couple clients that have been. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it all comes down to still, you still have to push your against resistance sometimes. Yes. Um, but you have to first really develop a keen somatic awareness of sensing when you're at your edge. This is what we're talking about by somatic capacity. Like where's the edge of that capacity? Mm -hmm. And when you're in a place of chronic fatigue or adrenal burnout, someplace where your system's gotten really compromised and you're coming back from that, I think it's about first discovering where that edge is. You need to learn, learn, learn to first feel what are the somatic cues? The what, Do I go into thoughts? Uh, do I start becoming dissociated? Do I get tense? Mm -hmm. What are the cues that I, tell me I'm at my edge? Mm -hmm. And then in, when you're in a process of stimulating the system intentionally to recover, it's about coming to that edge and maybe just nudging it just the tiniest, like, hello, I see you, and I'm just, oh, i give you a little kiss. Mm -hmm. And then and then you stop, you back yeah. off, right? It's like, you don't want to push past the edge because when you're coming from a place of burnout, then you can just send the whole system back into collapse and burn mm -hmm. out again. And mm -hmm. it, yeah, it doesn't go well. So yeah, it's find your edge, c learn how to come right to it, nudge it gently and back away and feel what it's like for the system to come down. Yeah. And, and you do that for a long time. Yep. Right? Titrate. And that, you know, that, extrapolates to someone who is fit and athletic, you know, a person who's fit and athletic can still push too far and then they get sure. injured. Sure. You know, they're not listening to their body's cues. They're, they're working out more than maybe their body can recover and, and they end up getting sick, you know, like a cold or a flu because the yeah. immune system is like, I can't keep up with this intensity. We're going to slap you down for a week. So you mm -hmm. recover and then you fall back even more. So there's, yeah. it's like it's the same thing but in a different um arena yeah. um you can always injure yourself even if you are fit and regulated and that's where people do get injured they don't yeah. know how to set that that's how i got injured in my 20s i right. 
I was so fit that I didn't have that little alarm bell that said, okay, you better slow down, Irene. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then that's, that's where I would always get hurt when I would be skiing. Um, so when you have that awareness on board, no matter where you guys are in this, it gives you, it really does give you an intelligent signal that says, okay, let's push, pull back a little bit. Let's pause. And then it is that trial and error of, is this pulling back more mental Mm-hmm. or is it physical because if it's mental and it's this part of you that doesn't want to push mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. it, again it's so hard to discern it but i do believe that resistance can actually be completely obliterated mm-hmm. um i know that uh, stephen pressfield who talks about resistance in his book i think it's war of art yeah. he will say and i just heard him talking to joe rogan about this we always have resistance it's always there and i would love to sit down with him and go Let's teach you about nervous system biology, because Mm -hmm. actually, I think, because I know this, you, there is, I don't feel any resistance to many things, Um, right? And it's not because I'm this perfect being, it's just that there's been so much work done Mm -hmm. that it's just gone. So I say that for those of you struggling with resistance, with more regulation and awareness, it really does go away. Would you agree? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think of anything that I, in the past few years, have had any resistance with at all. No. Um, no. Nope. Gonzo. Yeah. Poof. Thanks, Seth. Yeah. Any other additions? Any, like, last-minute pieces around, let's see, mm. um, money, making money, fitting in with society, <laughs> exercise... Well, I mean, this is pro- this video is probably not going to be viewed by many people who are really in the counterculture, um, <laughs> you know. But if there is anyone who is right. and who's seeing this, um, and you have an inkling that maybe, you know, there is something more, I'll just say that, you know, yeah, the world is. You're not wrong. Like the world's toxic. There's 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 bad stuff that goes on. There's greedy evil people, you know, um, there's institutions that are not healthy on so many levels, you know, yeah, the, the toxicity is real. The bastards are real, but it's like, how can you really make a difference without swimming in that same sea? It's like, it's fine if, you know, you want to stay apart and, and, you know, if that's really feeding you, then good. But I think that for some people, it's possible that they do want to contribute more or achieve more Mm -hmm. or do more have have more richness their life you know there's nothing wrong necessarily with having you know a decent home and a car that you know isn't always breaking down you know whatever it may be right so i'll just say that there can be benefit to confronting um some of that and looking at like what is it that's keeping me um attached to this particular lifestyle that is very removed and kind of limited Mm -hmm. um And if it works for you, great, you know, that's fine. Um, And I think in general, so much of what we've been talking about comes down to being able to feel yourself. Like none of these things that we're talking about can really be implemented without that connection to the felt sense. Uh, So I think that's where you start, no matter where you are on the spectrum of any of these topics is how can you deepen your connection to your felt sense? such that you can sense what your capacity is, you can sense where your edges are, so that you can connect to positive internal realities if you're in a workplace that isn't the best. Mm-hmm. Right? It all comes down to being able to feel yourself. So, you know, mm-hmm. that's what that why we do the work that we do and why you've created the programs you've created is to teach people how to do that. Right. So um, that's that's where you start, you know. And then the the thought I just had to kind of add to that is and I'd love to hear your take on this. I think I know it, but in a lot of that cu- counterculture, um, we could even say those intentional communities that people try to create mm. um, and all their variations, a lot of the um, two things, a lot of the reasons those places don't work, and I've heard this through another friend who's really studied these, uh, Joe mm-hmm. Martino, yeah. Um, is that those communities, those institutions, they are not very good at conflict revolution, and that's why things blow up. 
Mm. So resolving conflict and differences. And again, a lot of that I believe is because the nervous system lens isn't there. And a lot of the practices again, that I've seen where you were living and other more kind of hippie based places I've been to are very much dedicated to the breath work, to the meditation, to the practices that are quite somatic and spiritually bypassy. Mm-hmm. And I think there is a way to potentially, as we said a little while ago, live in that way, but it cannot be done from a bypass perspective. And that's why these things often mm-hmm. implode and explode yeah. and leave people worse off than when they got to those places. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you have to look at the, at least, you know, I, in all the years that I spent living in, you know, in communities and, you know, work trade situations and off grid and just in that community, by and large, almost every single person is really traumatized. Like there's a reason that we can't deal with the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not recognize that, um, within yourself and that's fine. Um, I know I didn't Mm -hmm. because I was spiritually bypassed because I was so into the meditation and the light work, et cetera. Like we're all just beings of energy, right? Uh, again, yes and no. You're a flesh and blood body too in this 3D world. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of unhealed wounds, um, a lot of trauma that gets recycled and never really addressed that gets played out in these uh, you know, largely dysfunctional communities dynamics. a lot of the time, the yeah. dynamics, right? Um, and there isn't this, yeah, this really informed trauma-informed lens uh, that's being uh, that's available to people there, um, mm-hmm. at least at, during my time and probably not so much still. So, no. yeah, I think we can, we know that. Yeah. So, um, all right. On that positive note, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to refer to an article I wrote a little while ago, just as a follow up to this that goes with what we were just talking about called, um, um, the mindfulness bubble and its mm, yeah. collapse. I, I'm getting the article name a little wrong there, but I will link that below. It's a, it's a longer article for all those listening um, that really uh, spells out this spiritual bypass world and why working at the nervous system is so important. Nervous system level is so important. The somatic level is so important. Um, so for those that want a deeper dive into understanding that, um, definitely look for that near this video, um, mindfulness bubble. And I think the word burst was in there. Yeah. Is there a mindfulness bubble waiting to burst? Thank you. I think that's what it was. Um, and it, it, it is a really comprehensive one, but explains in many ways what we were just talking about in a written way. So Mm -hmm. be sure to check that out. Um, and Thanks, Seth. Yeah. We will see you soon. See you upstairs. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, for anyone listening, Seth and I work together um, in the 12 week program that we run um, Smart Body, Smart Mind. You are not teaching the trainings or the, the exercises, but you do the QA calls. Yeah. So um, your expertise and knowledge is brought into those live calls um, every week when we're in live session. Yep. Um, and we'll be running uh, soon another uh, live session. So, um, of course, if someone's watching this later on in the year, just look near this video and you'll find out when things are happening next. Thanks, husband. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Hey, it's Irene. Quick note before you go. I want to make sure you know about my up coming enrollment to my 12 week online curriculum called smart body smart mind i will say that one more time smart body smart mind this is my online nervous system rewire and regulation program that my team and i have been running for many years this will be the 13th time we have run this powerful online curriculum with people all around the world so i want to make sure you know about the upcoming registration that will be mid-february for a short period of time, and we will start the live session end of February, 2023. It's a three month curriculum and it is life changing. So if you would like to do the work with me, and this is exactly where we do the work, deeper theory, practices, teaching with me live, Q and A sessions with my expert colleagues, this is what you wanna do. I want you to learn about it now so you have plenty of time to ask questions and make a 
non-survival based decision on joining this year. Somewhere near this video will be a link to that information page. Be sure to check that out and ask questions. If you have any questions, you can post one below this video or send us an email support at irenelyon.com.